I'm going to talk about the sufferings of Christ now. Remember, in this book, it divides up different aspects of troubles and trials. The first one is chastisement, and, and um, uh, the second one is the sufferings of Christ. And it's almost as opposite as, as you can get from chastisement. The sufferings of Christ come to those who are sons, to those who are mature, to those who understand um, the cross, and they understand the nature of the lamb and the relationship of the believer uh, in that uh, aspect of, of Christ and how we live on this earth. And uh, turn with me, if you would, to Philippians chapter 3. <clears throat> and most of you are familiar with uh, Philippians chapter 3. At least you're familiar with, you've heard it before. I don't know how well you're, I, I don't know. <laughs> All you know is chapter 2, verse uh, 5 through uh, 10, right? Okay. Well, since we're still making announcements, I'd like to welcome everybody on Skype. We've got Mary, Nicola, Rob Bardenette, uh, Sharon, Steve, uh, Claudia, Geraldine, and Alana. So I know you people that are from Ireland and Finland, you're either tired or crazy because, I mean, you, do you have any clue what time it is over there? Doug doesn't count. <laughs> Hi, Doug. Yes. Who does? Okay. Okay. <laughs> she scared me. Said so Doug's on, and turned to her, and she goes, "I just got a text that he's got." Look, Doug. <laughs> First, Larry, now Doug. What is going on? <laughs> Mike, yeah. Uh, who was it? You or somebody said, uh, right now, I wouldn't want to be Randy's friend. <clears throat> yeah. 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 Amen. Because <laughs> I'm very thankful for that. <laughs> okay. Just teasing. <clears throat> uh, all right. We are in Philippians and in chapter 3. Um, uh, in verse 4, Paul starts off like this, though I might also have confidence in the flesh. And when he says the flesh here, he's not talking about, um, you know, his abilities in the sense of, you know, that he's got a good mind or this or that or he's talented or any of the things that we might even think relate to the flesh. He's literally talking about his... Um, things that are gained to him in relationship to religion. And he's going he's to uh, quantify that as he goes here. Though I might also have uh, confidence in the flesh, if any other man think that he hath reason for which he might trust in the flesh, I more, and here he goes. Circumcised the eighth day. You see, the, what he's talking about, the flesh, is not what we talk about the flesh. We talk about the flesh as, oh, well, you know, I went, you know, I shouldn't have, but I went out to Beth Marie's and I ate a whole cake and a tub of ice cream or, you know, I don't know why we're getting laughter from over here. <laughs> Nonetheless, uh, or, or stuff like that, you know, something that, that quote unquote feeds our flesh. But what he's talking about is his religious um, what is the word I'm trying to find here? His heritage. achievements, uh, heritage, his heritage and, and uh, religious things that would make him confident before, if as it were, we'll just say believers, before God and believers, okay? <clears throat> He's calling that, that his flesh. That's what we would call not our flesh. That's what we would call the Lord. <laughs> And he is about to, to again make this uh, 
this division, this contrast between what is us, whether it's in this case really good, godly, but not God. Godly, but not God. Okay? Uh, as opposed to God, Christ in you. Christ being your, all, all of those things made unto you. All right. So he, in verse uh, 5 and 6, he rattles off all of his achievements and the things that he glories in and the things that he felt good about, how good he was um, as a religious man. But then, verse 7, he says, But what things were gained to me, those I count lost for Christ. And in this case, what he's saying that was gained to him you have to understand that they weren't gained to him. They were gained to him, but they weren't in his best interest. They were gained to him in the Jews' religion, and I, doesn't he use that phrase here? Is that over? That's probably over in Galatians. Uh, that he uh, prospered more than all of his brethren in the Jews' religion. That's over in Galatians, the first chapter. <clears throat> um, but what things were gained to me, talking about these spiritual things that made him appear something spiritual. Those I counted loss for Christ. Folks, this, he's not talking about his salvation experience here. This is already, he's been in the Lord for a lot of years. This is more towards the end of his life. And he's come to a place where he's realized that all the things that he worked for, in the Lord, I'm going to just say it like this, count for nothing. And he, he says it, it, it's dung. Okay, cow dung. C counts for nothing. I didn't say it, Mike. You thought it. That's the problem. <clears throat> you, what you thought was what I did say one other time, but, <clears throat> but I'm not going to now. <clears throat> um. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things, not just those religious things, but all things loss. In other words, we would say, we would, we would say, well, brother, you don't have to give up, you know, this and that and this and that. Okay, Lord help me. We'd say, you don't have to give up prayer. Well, you do. You have to give up prayer in the sense of how you've been praying. Your emphasis has to change to, to pray for more, an, in, an increase of Christ, not, you know, I, you know, I don't have time to explain all that, but I mean, it really is a, a huge monumental change in how you pray. And, you know, again, search out Paul's prayers in, in the epistles and you'll get an idea. He doesn't pray anything like what we pray. You know, oh, your sister Susie, well, let me, you know, he, does, he doesn't. He doesn't go, you just don't see all of that. Do, do I think that there's a place for that? Yes. Do I think that that should be the primary emphasis of our prayers? No. I don't think we understand what this is all about, and that's why we pray that way. We pray that way because we think that this is all about that we have come into relationship with Almighty God, and his goal now for the years that I live on this earth is to make me happy, comfortable, and order everything, you know, spiritual so that life is good. Well, that's not it. And you'll find that in what Paul's asking for and praying for even right here. <clears throat> but we're not there yet. Yea, doubtless, I count all things. In other words, I count these spiritual things, but I, I go ahead and count all things loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus. And he's going to sort of explain that as he goes here. My Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. Okay. For whom is the key little phrase there for whom I have he did this for Jesus he wants to gain uh, and when it says that I may win Christ it is the word gain it is the actual gaining of more of Christ he already has Jesus so why is he trying to gain Christ 
He's trying to gain Christ in him, in his life, in his walk, in his mind, in the way that he thinks, the mind of Christ, not his mind for Christ. And there's such a vast difference between those two, my Lord. <clears throat> All right, so for whom? And so what do, what do we see in Paul again? We see that thing. He is so driven based on Christ. It's not religion. It's not souls. It's not, uh, you know, uh, helping our family. It's not evangelization. It's not, it's not all of the things that we make it. Paul, he, is, he just sees this as about us gaining Christ in a greater measure than what we have now. And his measure is, I'm crucified, Christ lives. That's, that's, the, that's the full measure he's seeking for in his life. And that's the measure that he points to constantly. Because Jesus, to, to him, is the measure, the, that measure is the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's what we're shooting for. We're not shooting for all those things. I, I don't even know how to put it. I mean, many of the things are things that he's counting loss that we're shooting for. And, and he's, he's, uh, he's, he's focused. He's focused. And he's about to explain the depth of that focus. And that's, that's important. For whom? I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. All right. So we're not going to do this unless there has come a monumental change in our view, in our heart. The scriptures are going to have to become brand new. They're going to have to be Holy Ghost scriptures instead of ink on white paper. And until that happens, we may say this, you know, I, whom I've suffered the loss of all things, but we're not going to count them done. We're going to count them out of the picture for now or not important until they become important again. <laughs> you know, all that, that stuff that is driving us, and we can't help it. We will do that. We will do that until we see Christ. And only a person that has even recognized that that's what we are and we will do that until we see Christ will ever set their course and their sail and everything about them to count everything lost to win Christ. They won't do it. They won't do it. And, and another factor about this is this isn't Christ working in him to do this. It's Christ that he's after. This is a human person that has come to the place that they want Christ and they're seeking for Christ to be uh, uh, increased in them. And, you know, you can, you can want all day long, you know what I mean? I mean, I can go down here to Guitar Center and look at a uh, Les Paul guitar and go, ooh, I want that really bad, you know? But if I don't, you know, if I don't have any gumption, I won't get it. And you, when I say gumption, I don't know if that's a Texas word or not, but... <clears throat> Um, the wherewithal and the, and the desire to do whatever it takes to get that, well, that comes by God working in your life to want to eventually see Christ in such a way that you'll give up your life. Now, that's important because this right here, we think this is all Jesus working in him, and it's not. This is a man who's been dealt with by the Holy Spirit and is being drawn to want Christ in a greater way. Like, I want to gain Christ. I want Christ revealed in me. I want, he says, he, he's always using phrases like that. <clears throat> and that's why it's called, get ready, this is going to be monumental, and that's why it's called Christ in you. The you part has to have something that wants more than just, I just want to be saved, or I just want to be saved and, and guilt-free. So thank you, Jesus, for dying and being slapped and beaten and all this stuff. Really cool, man. Thanks. See you when I die. 
Yeah, yeah. But Paul is looking at that spirit of the Lamb, that spirit of Christ crucified, and it is so impacting to him. All right. Well, we say, okay, well, why isn't it impacting to us? Well, I'll tell you exactly why it's not, because we have not seen Christ crucified. We've heard. We've heard. And, and it's good to hear. But so many scriptures, you know, there are scriptures that talk about hearing, and there are scriptures that talk about seeing, and the contrast is pretty great. Stand still and see, you know. Quit working, stand still, and see. You, this battle, you don't have to fight in. But you have to see that. <laughs> you, you've heard it all your life, stand still and see the salvation of God. Well, you know, good for you. That's great. I'm so happy for you. But there has to come a desire that says, my God, you know what? My problem is not that I'm such a mess that I just have to go after Jesus. My problem is now that my good, what things were gained to me, my good is standing in the way of me gaining Christ, and I can't take it anymore. It cannot be. And that you, that you may be in that time zone for a year or two years. Or, or longer. It may take a while, but it's, it's worth it. But you don't, again, you don't just come to that. There has to be a crying out. There has to be words from the heart spoken to the Father. It's the only way I know how to put it. The, and, and so, anyway, so he's about to to, he's about to define what winning Christ is to him. What a definition. So, so contrary to my mind, to your mind, so contrary to the human mind, so contrary to the Christian mind, so biblical, so Christ-centered. So cross-centered. So, I mean, what, you know, what kind of man was this guy? What kind of, honestly, what kind of man was he? And he never holds back. He just never holds back. Wow. Verse 10, that I may know him. Okay, well, we can make that mean anything we want, can't we? We can make that mean anything we want. But he wants to know him in a specific way. And I will tell you, and I will tell you that these three are all joined as one. They're not three separate things. They are, can I say it, three in one. The Father may look different than the Son. The Son may look different from the Holy Spirit. But they're all the same substance. They're all one. And it all flows together. These three all flow together, that I may know him, how? And the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. Okay, so in the middle of this, we have the fellowship of his sufferings, and that's what we're talking about, the sufferings of Christ. But to see that, we have to see these three together. All right, he didn't ask for resurrection. He asked for the power of resurrection. All right, now I just want you to think for a moment. What is the power of resurrection? Death. In Christ, the power of resurrection is death. Isn't it? You say, well, I don't know if that's what he's saying here. Well, okay, that's fine, and, but you can't agree with me that... that the true power, there, I, I went over this in the Philippians class, but there, resurrection has no power. It is a result of something. Uh, it's a result of what? Death. Right? The power is in the cross. 
You know, people say, I want, the, the resur I want resurrection power. This isn't asking for resurrection power. And I've heard it preached and, and shouted and preached in such a manner that, you know, people are just, yeah, you know, resurrection power. Still to this day, one of my favorite preachers from the, from the old days. I love him to death, Brother Shambach. Anybody know Brother Shambach? Love that man. Boy, could he say resurrection power. I am serious. Hey, nobody can say resurrection power like Brother Shambach. Okay, well, that's not what we're after. <laughs> okay. And we're after what the Bible says, the power of his resurrection. We're looking for a power of his we're not looking for a power of, of, for our resurrection. I mean, do you see how often and how the way we misread the Bible, God's word, we call it God's word, and go, oh, it's holy, I believe it all. Well, how can you believe it all when you misread it? You know? I mean, you hear Jesus saying all the time, he'll quote a, he'll, before he quotes the scripture, he'll go, and as it is written... We need to read it as it is written, not the way that we think it, what it means. You know, we, we, we hear him say, as it is written, and we go, oh, yeah, you know, like that's some sort of spiritual oogie boogie way of saying, you know, this is, you know, here's what it says. And here's what it says. No, he's saying, as it is written, and then he says it. This is what this the know it and read it as it is written, not as men have preached to you or your carnal mind has made it form. Uh, the carnal mind will always form and, and, and uh, mold the scriptures to fit us, you know. And then we'll, we'll take our image of God and we'll form him in our image so that we're happy with him, you know. I've made God in my own image, you know. Oh my God, just, just Lord, just kill us all. <laughs> and he did at the cross. <laughs> and that's settled, okay. <laughs> yeah, that's, there's a victory right there. <laughs> all right, so then from that he's talking about and the fellowship of his sufferings. And, and here's what I believe the fellowship of his sufferings is. And I don't, I haven't had enough time to read all of this here in this here book, but you, uh, I encourage you to read it. <clears throat> the fellowship of his suffering, let me, I'm going to say several different ways here. The fellowship of his sufferings is to go through sufferings that he specifically went through. All right. What kind of sufferings are those? Well, that time that, you know, he disobeyed God and the time that he sowed bad seed and, you know, the time that, you know, he was you know, reaping what he sowed from that, that bad attitude he had that day. That's not the fellowship of his son. We go, I'm going through his sufferings. I'm experiencing the fellowship of his son. No, you're reaping what you sowed. Well, you know, it's not the same. It's not even close. It's, in fact, it's almost... Well, I was going to say something worse, but, but it's almost the opposite. Let's just say it's an abomination to God because we're equating to Jesus human frailties and failures instead of God coming down here and being accused of wrong and being... Uh, um, Slapped and you know all this kind of stuff and and being and and things that they should be punished for are being put on him and and uh, the ones who uh, uh, are are responsible for the judgment in this case whatever the case is they are covering their own sin and trying to make you look bad, and on and on and on. You know, I mean, we, you know, we could spend a while considering the sufferings of Christ. Okay, so 
only when you start entering into those things, but it is not your sufferings in, after all. It, one of the important marks of the sufferings of Christ is they're not your sufferings. They are because of Christ in you and because Christ chose to be slapped when he didn't deserve it. Can I get amen? Christ in us chose to be accused when we had nothing to do with it. Same thing that we just mentioned of Jesus, all of those things and more. However, there's still one more element, and that element is, well, let's see. I just want to, I know there was a scripture here. Yeah, here it is. Uh, it's um, in 1 Peter 4, <clears throat> verse 13, 14, and 16. And I'm reading out of your book, so if you want to read out of your book, it's the, sec the middle of the second paragraph on page 34. <clears throat> and it's uh, 1 Peter 4, 13, 14, 16, and it says this. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed... You may be glad also with exceeding joy. Let's stop right there. We are partaking of Christ's sufferings that when his glory shall be revealed. All right. Now we've talked about this before in one of the other classes, probably Philippians. Um, that the glory, the greatest glory of Christ was when he glorified God by laying down his life, by not being self-centered, by thinking about others first and suffered in the process of it. Uh, now is the Son of Man glorified, was that for uh, John 12, 23. Now is the Son of Man glorified, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die. Okay. <clears throat> we think the glory comes when we get resurrected. You may be I'll say it like this. You may be glorified. God may exalt you for, for you allowing Christ to come out of you in those situations. But in truth, he's always glorifying his son. He is. Um, but but we're his body, and we share in that glory. You know, John 17, when Jesus said, you know, people, people have told me, said, uh, well, God's a, uh, God will not share his glory. You know, with anybody ever heard that? God will not share his glory. But, you know, John 17, I can't remember which verse right offhand. You can look it up. And Jesus plainly says that the glory I had with you, Father, they may have also. See, I mean, I'm always... <laughs> It's like, I hear these statements, and they're not biblical, and they're statements. Maybe even from the Old Testament, but Jesus speaks, and he tells us, you're my body, you're one with me. And so when I hug Jesus, I hug you. When I glorify Jesus, I glorify you, meaning, you know, number one, first and foremost, the cross that he allows such things for you because he's not going to put you in that position if you're not, I mean, you know, if you're not at least supposed to <laughs> respond correctly. <laughs> I'll just put it that way. Uh, the reason why I say that is because this verse goes on to say, um, <clears throat> rejoice in as much as you're partakers of Christ's sufferings that when his glory shall be revealed, not yours, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. All right, so you're, you are glorified in the fact that, uh, this, that you're partakers of his sufferings, that when his glory. See, it's all about him, and that's hard for us because we think, because we've been trained that it's all about us. And my friends, you, it's, what, you know, to, to use it lightly, how embarrassing to stand before the throne of the Lamb of God and realize that every eye is on him and nobody's looking at you. And you're going, hey, look what I, hey, hey guys, you know, I did some stuff too. <laughs> and they're going, hey, get your eyes on Jesus. 
I, I'm sick of that. I heard that my whole time in Bible school. <laughs> well, that's, that's the way it is. The Father, the Holy Spirit, they're going to make sure that that's where it goes. Anyway, there's more here. Um, when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with this exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are you, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. Okay, there's the big whammeroony. There's the big killer right there. Because I know people that go through sufferings and maybe even the sufferings of Christ, maybe even they are being reproached for things they didn't do and being accused, falsely accused, and on and on and on, but they wonder why the spirit of glory and of God never rests upon them. It's like... All they can remember is it was a bad experience. <laughs> you know, there is no, that part of the scripture is always left out with them. Because they don't see sufferings the way Paul did when in, uh, there in Philippians when he said to know him in the fellowship of his suffering. And to, he's, he's actually asking God to invite him in to a special fellowship of the nature of God. That's the only way I know how to put it because that nature of God will suffer when others want to be glorified and will get low and have the spirit of glory and of God resting upon them. They'll be going, Woo, this is such a blessing to be here. I mean, this is just like, this is heaven itself, you know? You, I mean, I'm, I'm failing miserably, miserably to try to explain that spirit because you can't. You can't. You have, to, you have to be with the Lord in that spirit, not just in that experience. Not just in that experience. Okay. So what you are experiencing is in that spirit of, of uh, glory and of God resting upon you, <clears throat> is you are experiencing a joy and a, a, a sense of privilege that you have been ushered in with the Godhead and you see, as it were, maybe not at that moment, but going in to those sufferings, you see that when you're with them, that um, to give and give up and to lose by his spirit is such a joy. I mean, I don't even know how to put it. I don't. Well, it's just ridiculous for me to say these words. I mean, I, read it. It's right there. But, I, you know, I'm trying to, hope, I'm hoping that the Holy Spirit may, by his grace, release something. Because I think this is the kicker here. I think this is where we lose it. I think we don't really fellowship with him in this suffering. We just go through it and say, hey. I know what you mean, Jesus. They mistreated you. That ain't it. <laughs> that ain't it. That ain't it. You say, well, you know, well, what are you saying? That all I've been through has been for nothing? Yeah, that's pretty much because it's, well, it's not, th well, I'm saying it's not this. And if you were shooting for this, then <laughs> it's for nothing, you know, because. Paul didn't say, I want to experience your sufferings. He didn't say that. He said, I want to experience the fellowship of this. All right. So only those who have, and when I say, when I say this, 
that can be up to this point or next week or 10 years from now or 100 years from now. Only those who have really, uh, oh, I've been working on some stuff today that I could just ooh, share with you so good about the tabernacle. But uh, only those who, Only those who see the cross not at the crucifixion, but in the Holy of Holies with the rent veil will have any clue. Only that. When they start seeing the cross there instead of standing out on Calvary's Hill looking up and trying to figure it out. Uh, so let me put it another way because I know that you don't see that yet or maybe you do um, when you see past Jesus of Nazareth and you see past a savior dying on a cross and you see, you know what? The Catholics call it a sacred heart. I, we can pervert that or whatever, but I'm telling you, somebody saw something of truth there. Sacred heart of Jesus. The sacred heart of Jesus. You know, and I know anyone who knows anything about Catholics and that particular thing, they see Jesus standing there with this open chest and this heart with ventricles, you know, cut and everything and Jesus smiling well there's still something to that sacred heart of Jesus and that smile um, when you see you know and, and I'm not talking about an organ when you see the organ and call it sacred then you then you will have learned don't proceed by trying to apply my words. Go to the Lord, go to the Father, go to the Holy Spirit and say, if there's anything of you in that crazy man's words, um, don't show me what he's trying to say. Show me what you mean. Show me what you mean. And I believe that if you'll uh, keep that desire beyond two days, <laughs> I do. I believe that if you can hold it for, you know, beyond two days of feeling, oh, I just really want, and then, you know, one day all of a sudden, you know, I think I'll turn on the TV, and, you know, and it's like, <sighs> you know. But instead, but instead, if you do, if you, if you desire the Lord now, then he will lead you to the place where you will desire the Lord more than your things. Then he will lead you to the place that you will desire the Lord more than your own life. And, and he will open himself because he, you can't desire the Lord more than your own life. You can desire the Lord more than your own things without seeing the essence. But you can't want the Lord more than your own life without seeing the essence. So between giving up things, counting things loss and giving up yourself, there has to come and that's his responsibility. That, that's the Lord. That's the Father sunning you, you know, treating you like a son. And uh, when your heart turns to the Lord, <laughs> the veil is rent. <laughs> Glory to God, I just want to stop. <clears throat> I, you know, it's enough of me. Let's, let's let the Holy Spirit talk for a second.
Father, we just come and we just are gathered in your presence, not in a Bible school or church service. We're just gathered at your feet and we're gathered in your presence, Jesus, and we just we just want to quit looking at you as the one that's going to fix everything for us. We want to start examining your wounds. Jesus, when Thomas doubted, you said, look at my wounds. And Lord, we doubt so much, even though we think we're doing good. I do. But Lord, help us to see the slain, the slaughtered, that you've made Lord. And help us not just to see an event or, or a moment in time when God was self-giving, but help us to, Holy Spirit, help us to comprehend God. Help us to see that first in Jesus, the door, and then enter into the three in one so that God may be all in all as you said. And so, um, Father, we're so far, honestly, we're so far from you in these things. Our minds are so filled with blockages, good ideas, and great concepts, religious concepts that are keeping us from you. So Jesus, we need you to die in our minds. Jesus of Nazareth, we need you to die. And be put away and never rise again as Jesus of Nazareth, but to be express image. God. And so we we do our best little attempt at humbling ourselves and humbling our heart. But Lord, we know that we're never, ever, ever going to get to holy ground unless we start making baby steps. We've got to do something. We've got to start. We've got to start making steps toward you or we're going to end up bankrupt with a religion sitting in our lap instead of us sitting in the lap of of him with whom we have been raised up and made to sit together. Help us, Father, to break out of this, the tentacles of this thing that holds us so that we might be with you, that we might be fathered by you, Jesus, that we might be conformed to your death. Holy Spirit, that we might experience the power of his resurrection. The power of it. So Lord, I pray you'll bless your people. Bless your people. Gather them into that reality of your heart. Gather them into that reality of your heart. Keep them, Father. Keep them. For they will surely go astray somewhere along the way if they don't understand your selfless life. Keep them until you can be revealed in them. Father, I love them and I know that I do because you love them. Jesus, that you love them. I pray, Father, for them. 
not for myself, Lord. I excluded myself from this prayer, not because I don't need it, but because I love them and I ask you, whatever I may have prayed or desired, give it to them instead of me, Lord. Lord, give it to them freely and abundantly. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, some of you need to go. If you need to sit a moment longer in the presence of the Lord, please feel free to do that. You have every assurance that you can do that.